But today, um, I wanted to shed some light on the Bible itself. The Bible itself. The Bible is a collection of 66 books written by over 40 authors from all sorts of different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, one of the authors of the scripture, moved along by the Holy Spirit, was a farmer. Uh, one of the authors was also a physician and one a tax collector. Some were prophets. Um, some were just men called by God to uh, write his very words. And all these people who were inspired by God to write the word of God also came from many different places. Some came from Babylon, some came from uh, Israel itself, some came from Greece. And so the Bible is, is the best, the earliest and the best, both connected together, earliest and best, attested work uh, from in, in all of history. In all of history, the earliest and best attested collection of writings in, in all of history. Uh, nothing even comes close. When you go to the time period of, of, of antiquity, and you look at uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, you look at uh, you know, Homer and, and all these different writings, nothing comes close to how important the Bible is in history. It was treasured, it was copied, it was transmitted throughout the ages to uh, the, the north, south, east, and the West, it was very valuable. And by the way, it is also the undisputed champion of bestsellers of books in the world in all history. It is, it, it is so known that they don't even put it on the list anymore. I wish they still would. Just show us it is the undisputed champion. Um, unthreatened, not even close, not even close. But the purpose of the Bible is not to wow you with its stats. It's not to wow you with, with all the ways that it came together, even though that, that is very encouraging to our faith, absolutely. But the purpose of the Bible, the reason God gave us his special revelation in the way that he did, through all these different kinds of people, uh, throughout all these different time periods, written over the span of about 2,000 years. The reason God did that is so that you can know about who he is and his standard of righteousness. And not only that, not only knowledge, it's not only meant to just uh, help you uh, open up your mind to understand who God is and what he expects of us, but the word of God is also meant to change your life, to change your life. Has the Bible changed your life? Has the Holy Spirit changed your life? This morning, I want that to be in your mind, that as we study these things, as we study these people in history and how God has interacted with them, I want you to ask yourself, how is this changing my life? Is this changing my life? And also, as we approach the scriptures, I think it's important that if we're going to wield such a sword, we need to wield it with responsibility. Because we can use this for good or for evil. We can use this to help or we can use this to hurt. We can use this to help change other people's lives or we can use this for our own benefit and our own gain. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul, he talks about how there were those early on who used the word of God for their own personal and financial gain. And I'm sure that you can think of some people in Christendom uh, even today, who use the word of God, who use the Lord's name as a means for financial and personal gain. So you have a great responsibility this morning, just as I have a great responsibility to teach you the word, is how are you going to wield this sword? It is very uh, sharp, it's powerful, it is dividing uh, soul and spirit and bone and marrow, it is living and active, and it is is sharp. So I want to encourage you this morning to wield it well. Um, a movie I like is um, The Book of Eli. Have, have, have you seen The Book of Eli? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Uh, the Book of Eli has Denzel Washington, and it's a post-apocalyptic kind of movie, and it is rated R for language and violence, so if, if that's something you cannot handle, I encourage you not to. 
uh, watch the film. But I think uh, the overall arching um, storyline is a very good storyline. Denzel Washington is uh, tasked by God to take the Bible to an unspecified location. He just knows he's supposed to take it somewhere. Uh, and he knows and he is confident that he will. And when the uh, antagonist comes on the scene, I think it's Gary Oldman who plays the antagonist. And uh, the antagonist is a book collector. And he knows the value of books, especially in a post-apocalyptic uh, post world. And so he tries to get his hands on this book that Denzel has. And when he finds out that it's the Bible, he remembers from pre-apocalypse. He remembers the, the power of the Word of God, how people would just flock to the Word of God, and how people would, would use the Word of God in, in powerful ways. And so he tries to get his hands on the book. And I'm not going to spoil the end for you if you've never seen it. But the purpose of that is there are people who use this for evil. They understand the influence it has. My wife and I have been watching... Um, we're caught up in watching these documentaries about uh, cults. And uh, last night there was a documentary on a certain cult, which even made its way to Spokane. Um, but people misusing the word of God to deceive people uh, for their own selfish purposes. And so this morning as we look into Genesis chapter 25, I want you to bear in mind the responsibility that we have. We have a great responsibility to handle the word of God rightly. So that we can all, hopefully, be approved as workmen unashamed for God's purposes. So let's pray. We'll dig into Genesis chapter 25. Father, thank you for the word which you have given us even here today. It's amazing to look at the way in which you have brought your special revelation to us in the scriptures. Just what a privilege it is to be able to have your scriptures. And I'm, I'm mindful, I'm reminded of the church in China, which I read about this morning, uh, which all the people were drug outside of the church, the church was leveled, the people were beaten uh, severely, and the Bibles were taken away from them. And I'm just so amazed at the privilege we have here today. Um, and my heart goes out to those Christians there who are truly following after uh, Paul and, and Christ and who are experiencing those same things. God, I ask that you would comfort them, you would give them strength and courage to believe even in the face of death. And Father, help us not to take for granted what we have here today, that we can stand here without fear of anybody knocking down our door and dragging us outside, that we can be here and just freely study your, your truth. So God, uh, help us to change as a result of your word and by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here we are in Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to go back into a little bit what we talked about last week uh, to overlap today. Let's we'll start in verse 23, and I hope you have your Bibles here today. Um, really, there's no excuse not to anymore. I'm not going to chastise you uh, hard. If you don't have it, I'm not going to point you out and make you come up front and, and say Hail Marys or anything like that. Nothing like that. <laughs> but uh, really, you know, in the future, um, come prepared. Come ready with your sword. Many of you come equipped with your uh, Second Amendment right, don't you? If you have your gun on your hip, well, do you have the sword of truth with you? Um, if you have a smartphone, you can have the sword of truth with you. Um, in fact, I'd encourage you to do it that way. Because I remember when um, I was younger and I knew the Bible less, and I knew where books of the Bible were less, uh, I remember the pastor would say, all right, now turn in your Bibles to this passage. And I would always be really nervous that the people next to me would see that I'm struggling to find the book. And I even still do that sometimes today, especially with the minor prophets. I mean, they're like two pages long, and, you know, Obadiah, what, what, where is that, you know? And, um, or, you know, if you're in the New Testament, it's hard to find Philemon sometimes. It's one page. You know, I, I get that. So don't be, uh, you know, if that's a problem that you have, too, you're not alone. Okay, even, even me, I have that problem sometimes, too. Um, so don't be ashamed of that. The way to fix that is with a smartphone, because you can type in, you know, uh, Obadiah, bam, right there. Uh, finally, bam, you're right there. Nobody is going to judge you, all right? So I'd encourage you to really just make that a priority in your life. Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. The Lord said to her, to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. 
Let me review from last week. Throughout the generations, God has demonstrated his sovereignty over history, his sovereign choice over history. Even starting from uh, Abraham and into Isaac and now into Jacob and Esau, God has demonstrated his sovereignty. He has told them beforehand what was going to take place. He has assured them that, for example, that Isaac, not Ishmael, was the son of promise. And God followed through with that word, with that assured word and that assured promise. In the same way, as Rebekah was experiencing great discomfort in her stomach because her sons were, by nature, wrestlers, and they were wrestling inside of her womb and causing her great pain and discomfort, she cried out to the Lord, as they did, God, what is happening? This is too much to bear. I would rather be dead. And then God said to her uh, what we just read here. And so God has demonstrated that throughout history, which is why last week we really focused on the fact that if you want to pray with 100% guarantee that God is going to answer your prayer, then pray according to his promises. Pray according to his will. And that is essentially the main function of prayer is to align your heart with the Lord's heart, is for your heart and your mind to be aligned with his promises and his will. So that way, when you do pray according to his promises, you can pray with absolute certainty that he is going to answer your prayer because of his promise. And so in the same way, we see how God demonstrates his own freedom to choose. As Jesus said to his disciples, for I have chosen you, you have not chosen me. God is the one who chooses. God has that freedom as the potter to choose the clay. And also, he has the freedom to do whatever pleases him. Psalm 115.3 tells us that God does what he pleases, and he surely does. And thank God that he is good. Because imagine if we served a God who did whatever he pleases and who chose whoever he decided to choose, uh, and he was evil. Imagine that. That would be rather unsettling. In fact, some people have made the argument that, well, maybe he just is evil, because he allows evil to happen. But we know better, don't we? We know that he is good. We have tasted and we have seen that he is good. So what pleased God, what satisfied God, his choice and his redemptive plan was to choose a nation from Isaac's offspring to come through Jacob, the younger, not Esau, the older. This pleased God. This was God's choice as the potter to choose Jacob. So here we have two nations that God tells Rebekah about. There are two nations within your womb. From Jacob... The child of promise would come the nation of Israel. God would change his name into Israel. Jacob's 12 sons would become the 12 tribes of Israel. And a full quarter of the book of Genesis is dedicated to Jacob, more than any other we've gone through so far. So Jacob is clearly a point of emphasis in God's special revelation in Israel's history, in redemptive history, in our history. So Jacob is the chosen son. Also Esau, Esau, uh, from Esau and his offspring would come the Edomites, which is a nation who would become divided against Israel for a majority of their existence. Moses, for example, was not permitted to travel through the land of Edom. Um, he was not permitted that. David also conquered the Edomites at one point, and Israel ruled over them for a time. And also the Edomites successfully revolted uh, against Israel at one point. And on and on and back and forth, it's almost just like in the womb again, two nations in the womb just wrestling back and forth, uh, one overtaking the other, the other take, overtaking, just a divided nation. And so we see throughout Old Testament scripture that God's promise is in fact true, that they would be a divided nation. So Esau would become the Edomites, Jacob would become the Israelites. And it's also said here in the promise of God that the older will serve the younger. 
Now, their human tradition at that time was that the older son would receive the blessing of the inheritance, that they would receive the birthright, uh, that they would be the child of honor. That was the tradition at the time. In fact, many cultures still carry on that tradition. And the most amazing thing about this promise of God is that it runs counter to the, pro to the traditions of men. And I have found that God just loves to do that. He loves to do that. He loves to look down from heaven, look at our traditions that we develop and that we just, just hold on to with a vice grip. We love our traditions, don't we? We just love them so much. And eventually to the point where we think, well, it must have come from God because we've been doing it for so long. It's, it's our tradition. But then God comes down and he says, no, your ways are not my ways. My ways are much higher than your ways. And especially, and I think the reason he does this is because he wants to defy our expectation, defy uh, what we see as tradition, so that at the end of the day, everybody has to say that it was God who was in this. It wasn't because of the traditions of man that God succeeded. It's because God succeeded in the most unlikely way. He did it through the younger son. And also, as we look at the character of these two boys, these two young men, we're going to find that God does an amazing thing through them. So the older shall serve the younger. Moving on to verse 24. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau, not Esau, Esau. After his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. This means that, by the way, just a side note, this means that Isaac prayed for 20 years for his barren wife to give birth to his children. I, I think it's funny how it, it, they, the scriptures force you to kind of connect the dots on that. Because can you imagine praying for 20 years for your barren wife to give birth? We are so impatient. We don't get that. You know, we pray for maybe a day, a week, and then we get impatient. God's never going to answer my prayer. These people were patient prayers. And I would encourage you to develop uh, patience within your prayers. If you're praying according to his promises, be patient. Be patient. He will answer according to his will and his promises. So 20 years. Uh, verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew. Hold on, let me, let me get more of Esau. Though. Let me eat some of that red stew, for I'm exhausted. <laughs> Therefore, his name was called Edom, which... Edom means red, so that's where we get Edomites from, red. Jacob said, and I'll try and get Jacob. I, I, I view Jacob as kind of more of a postmodern kind of character, so. Sell me your birthright now, Esau said. No, yeah, it's, don't go there. Just because you have a list doesn't mean anything. I'm about to die. Or let's see, where am I? Oh, yeah. Sell me your birthright now. And so Esau said, I'm about to die! Of what use is my birthright to be? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Let's look at their profiles so you can see why I profiled them in that way and I gave them that, um, that uh, accent. First Esau, Esau, as we find, was a man's man, okay, he was a man's man. I, I think of, uh, on the movie Braveheart, um, uh, the character William Wallace, his, his good friend was a big, huge redhead, and almost kind of like a little John character, just really big, tree trunk legs, you know, very hairy chest, uh, you know, like bare skin rug, hairy chest, wore, wore his, you know, his gown down a little bit so the hair flopped out a bit. <laughs> Probably had a really nice gnarly beard, you know, red red hair. Um, I think Amish was his name in, in 
Braveheart. Uh, you know, uh, look, at, look at Charlie. He's got that, that red <laughs> beard. It just man's man. Um, he was the alpha male, you know, the alpha male kind of character. Rough and gruff. Maybe you'd even nickname him like Beast Mode. He was the firstborn. He was red and hairy. He was a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. And he was loved by his dad, Isaac. He was a daddy's boy. However, we also see that he was not too wise. He was kind of impulsive. He was ruled by his stomach. He just threw away his birthright because he was hungry. He was impulsive. He was kind of a brutish man. He disparaged his birthright. Jacob, on the other hand, I kind of see as, uh, like today, you might call him like a geek, a uh, nerd, which is actually a term of uh, honor today. Because if you're a geek today, chances are you're probably rich too. <laughs> and if you're rich, you're powerful. Um, so geeks today, Jacob was very much that way. He, I wouldn't maybe go as far as to say he was a beta male, but he, was, uh, he wasn't as what we would consider today manly as Esau was. Uh, he was a homebody. He was second born. He was born, as it says, holding on to Esau's heel. There was just that, that uh, wrestling and that division in the womb, which was very clear as they were coming out. Him holding the heel is very much a confirmation to Rebekah, to Isaac, that God, uh, God's word is true, that it's going to be uh, that way. He liked to dwell in the tents. He liked to stay inside. As Esau was out in, in God's country, as he was out with his bow, and as he was hunting lions, uh, Jacob, I just want to stay at home. Can I just stay at home? I just want to sit in the tent. That's just what I want to do. He was an introvert, I think. He was loved by his mama, the kind of boy that only a mama could love. And because he was a mama's boy, he was a chef as well. He liked to cook things. He liked to bake. Um, but he was also crafty and opportunistic. He was crafty and opportunistic. We're going to see this this week and then also in the coming weeks. We're going to see his craftiness as a part of his character. So when I think about these two, they're very different from one another. In fact, this morning as I was talking about them, perhaps you could identify yourself with one or the other. Um, can you guess which one I identify with? I know Amy can. <laughs> Jacob. I identify with Jacob. I gotta say. Um, you know, I, I, which is weird that God would call me here because the vast majority of you are like Esau's. <laughs> when it comes to men. I mean, you, you are manly men. And I really look up to you. You love hunting. You love being outdoor. And, and I'm back here like the Jacob just, you know, I just want to sit inside. <laughs> I just want to play my video games. That's all I want to do. You, know, you guys go kill the bear and I'll pick it when you get home. <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest, that's who I identify with. Uh, and, you know, I'm, by nature I'm a salesman. So, you know, the interaction with, uh, with the whole stew thing, you know, I, I kind of identify with that. I'm like, I'm like, yeah. Look, Esau is such an easy sell. I mean, the, guy, the guy's hungry. Oh, me, so hungry. You know? Well, give me your birthright. Okay. You know? um, I'm, you know, I'm just stereotyping big time this morning. I'm glad you guys are gracious people. Because, uh, but that was essentially their profile. Uh, one was very much an extrovert, one was an introvert. And uh, one thing you know, I've learned about myself and about being somewhat of a, you know, believe it or not, as a pastor, I am kind of an introvert. I, uh, I am energized by being alone. And a lot of times I prefer to be alone. It just, I, I, that's where I get my energy from. Whereas extroverts, they get their energy from being with people and just being out, out and doing something. Um, so very much uh, that was their, their profile, that's what they did. And <clears throat> if you were going to select somebody as Isaac, if you were going to give somebody your blessing as their father, 
you know, surely you would probably give it to Esau because he was you know, that, that man's man. He was the alpha male. He was beast mode. He could, he could hunt really well. He could go out uh, with your son, you know, and your other son stand back home with the mom, you know, and wearing the aprons and stuff. And, and he, Esau is out there and he's doing man stuff. He's got blisters all over his hands, you know. Yeah, that, that's, my, that's my boy. That's my man. He's the one who's going to He's going to carry on my name, and, and nobody is ever going to threaten this family because, you know, he's a warrior. He'll, he'll get them, you know. I, 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 I love Jacob. I love Jacob, too. Um, you know, but, but Isaac, he's, he's a man's, man's man. And it's very important, the words that we see here, where it says that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. Because it's important to note that because in Malachi... We're given insight into the overview of their life. Uh, Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. God is talking to Israel, which is the descendants of Jacob. He's talking to the people Israel. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. Loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. Now, if we look at that context of Isaac loving Esau, of Rebekah loving Jacob, does that necessarily mean that they they wanted nothing to do with their other son? No, the language that is used here is meant to point out that the preference, the parental preference was with one, not the other. That their blessing was given to one, not the other. Rebecca gave her blessing, her, her favor to Jacob, Isaac, to Esau. So when God says, I have loved Jacob, but Esau I hate it, the idea is loved less. God loved Esau less than Jacob. God put his favor with Jacob and not Esau. Why? Is it because of something that Esau had done? Is it something that uh, in the womb that maybe God saw, you know, a characteristic of him that he saw that he just thought, you know, he's going to be some trouble. Uh, you know, he's, he's a man's man, all right, but uh, he's kind of foolish in his behavior. So therefore, I'm going to choose Jacob. Is it because of anything they've done? I want you to hang on to that question. Did God choose Jacob, not Esau, because it's anything that they had done? Okay, hang on to that question. God choosing Jacob, I think, should be more startling to us than God not choosing Esau. I hear a lot of people say, like, how could God, why would God do that? Why would he say, I, Jacob I love, Esau I hate it? What should startle us more, at least to the biblically trained mind, it should startle us that how could God choose to love Jacob? For that matter, how could God choose to love any one of us? We are an imperfect creature. We are a creature made from the dust, made from the ground. God has given us life. He has breathed life into us as a creature. Not only that, but he has set us apart from all the other creatures that he made. He made you and me in his image and after his likeness. We are a unique creature in the creation of God. And not only that, but he has made a covenant with us, a covenant relationship with us, that even after we chose to sin against him and his perfect nature, that God has made a way, because of his grace and his mercy, for us. Now that should just astonish you. That should astonish you, that a perfectly holy God would even give us a chance. When he said to Adam and Eve that you will surely die when you eat of this fruit, he should have at that very moment followed through and, and just wiped us out. But he has given us grace after grace after grace after grace. Not only in redemptive history, but in our own lives. Think about your own life. Think about how many times you have failed to live up to his standard. More times than I like to think about. Now, not only just once a day, but many times a day, I fail the Lord. 
he shows me grace after grace after grace after grace. And through Jesus Christ, we have witnessed grace after grace after grace. So that should be more startling to you, not the fact that, that God is not favoring Esau, because all of us, none of us, deserve the favor of God. None of us do. All of us deserve death. All of us deserve to be separated from God from all eternity. None of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve his mercy. None of us deserve his grace. So we must start from that position. That the very fact that he is even choosing Jacob and putting his blessing on Jacob to become his chosen people, to have 12 offspring who would become the tribes of Israel, who from them, from the tribe of Judah, from David, would come Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The fact that God did that through our redemptive history, that should just blow your mind. Because to think in the other way, to think that somehow God owes us something, somehow God owes us his, his love, God owes us his special favor, God doesn't owe us anything. God is God. We are not. God is the creator, we are the creature. And therefore, he should be eternally praised forever. Amen. We are the creature. Never forget that. We don't make demands of God. God sets the rules according to his own good pleasure. God chooses you, you don't choose God. God chose Jacob, Jacob did not choose God. So here we have these two nations, it's playing out. Their distinct and clashing personalities were apparent, uh, even from inside the womb, but as they came out as well, very distinct characters. And I want to take a moment to think about our own children. Uh, do you choose how your children are going to be? I used to think that uh, nurture played a huge part in the character of, of your children, more than I should have. I used to think that yeah, I, I can mold my kids into a certain way, into a certain character. I used to believe this. You can mold them into a certain way. You know, you can, you can run it like you run in the military, and you're going to get them to be a certain way. You can believe that all you want. But boy, when they come out, uh, you, you know, from within the womb, and then when they come out, the, the very first crying and breath, totally different. Totally different. I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, if we just maintain a uniform home, uniform rules, uh, you know, and we're very consistent in how we parent, both kids, that surely they're going to end up the same way. And my kids, they came out, they had a personality of all their own. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Was it God? Did God form them in my wife's womb? Did God give them certain personality traits? Did he make one that uh, their bone structure and their makeup would, would turn them into a giant someday? <laughs> Sophia, she's, she's going to outgrow me, I'm convinced. And then the next one they came out made her into a little widget. <laughs> you, know? uh, you, you can't plan stuff like that. Do you control how your kids are going to be? No, you don't. God does. God does. It's just incredible. And yeah, my kids' personality is going to be any more different. Um, I'm thankful they get along, but they are very different. My daughter, Sophia, you know, she is so caring and compassionate. Where did that compassion come from? It didn't come from me. Um, for those of you who really know me, you know that I struggle with compassion. It's not a gift that comes natural to me. I have to really work at it. Um, my wife, maybe, you know. Uh, she, she can be a lot more compassionate than I can. <laughs> but Sienna... Uh, Sienna, you know, she is, she is very kind of logically thinking. You know, I think she gets that from my wife, but ultimately she gets that from the Lord. Sophia, uh, she's struggled her whole life with what we call developmental delay. We, you know, we don't know. We've, we've gone to all the different doctors, everything we could possibly do to try and diagnose, you know, why? Why was it that way? We go back and we even think about you know, some of the homes we lived in. You know, what, what is it because there was mold in the house? You know, uh, Amy beats herself up all the time. Was it something I ate? Or uh, you know, was it 
X, Y, and Z? We don't know. You know, we, we've gone through everything, and there's just no answer. And the only answer is, you know, God made her to be a very specific way for his specific purpose. And that's the position we have to take. Um, because she is, she's very unique in that way, in, in that um, she sees things the way I don't see them. She sees, she sees things the way that Amy doesn't see them, uh, or really anybody. And she brings great value to our family. Great value, I believe, to uh, Deer Park Elementary, where she goes to school. The teachers love her. Great value, I believe, to the world. Not in the way that, that I would bring value or Amy would bring value, but in Sophia in her unique special way. She brings value. Same thing with Sienna. How did she get so smart? She is brilliant. We didn't plan that. You know, we, we'd love for both of our kids uh, to be um, Rhodes Scholars and you know, uh, just <laughs> geniuses you know, and all that. Solve all the world's problems, cure cancer, all that kind of stuff. But you know, she, she is the way that she is by the grace of God. King David wrote in Psalm 22.10, From my mother's womb you have been my God. Psalm 139.19 likewise says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Nobody can claim to know exactly how God does it, how he brings us together, as much technology as we have. We, we don't know the, the depth of God's creative ability when he is creating a human life within the womb of a woman. We don't know. King Solomon, who is one of the greatest natural observers in human history, he accounted in Ecclesiastes 11.5, as you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with a child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. His ways are beyond us. They are higher. His thoughts are higher, way beyond us. We think we know, but we don't know. God knows. He is the one. Galatians 1.15, the Apostle Paul writes, God set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace. The Apostle Paul recognized that God chose him, not, not on the basis of what he had done, but on God's good pleasure and good will for all of us. So when it comes to the sovereign work of God, is God then unjust to select Jacob and not Esau? You might ask, how can God find fault in anybody if he chooses one but not the other? How, you know, how can God find fault in one he doesn't choose? Was there any chance that after God spoke that what he said would come to pass would not come to pass? Was there any chance when he said you're too... Children would be two nations divided against each other, and that the older will serve the younger. Was there any chance that that wasn't going to come true? In other words, is there any chance God was wrong? Was God wrong? Why am I pressing this point? Well, in the most doctrinally important book in the New Testament, in my opinion, in one of the most disputed chapters in the church today of the Bible, Paul presents a soteriological apologetic to the church at Rome for God's freedom to choose. Now, the church of Rome was a diverse group of believers. It was made up of uh, Jewish believers, staunch Jewish believers, holding on to their Jewish traditions and backgrounds. It was also made up of uh, Gentile believers, new Gentile believers grafted in. And the question to Paul, in which he responds to, in Romans chapter 9, which if you have your Bibles, you can start flipping there. The question he was responding to was, why, if you're presenting this gospel, why aren't some of the Jews responding? Why aren't some of the Jews accepting it? And so... Uh, Romans chapter 9 is his direct response to that. Because the question is, if they are God's unique and chosen people, shouldn't they all be receiving Paul's message for salvation? That's the question. So let's read Romans chapter 9 together. On your phones or on your paper. 
Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, sons of Jacob, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Neither are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is a word of promise. At this time, I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not yet, yet done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose, according to his choice, might stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. I want you to notice verse 11. For though the twins were not yet born and had not yet done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose, according to his choice, might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. That's crucial to your theology. Verse 12, it was said to her, the older, older will serve the younger. Just as it was written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. There he's quoting Malachi chapter 1. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the, on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? The question I asked earlier. For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. I'm going to allow the Word of God to speak for itself. I'm going to allow you to meditate on the Scripture yourself. It's my job here to tell you what the Bible says. It's your job to make a decision. But I would encourage you, in your theology, in your view of God, and who He is, and how He works, how He operates, not only through redemptive history, but even now, it's your job to determine from the Scripture how that is. The aim of this kind of revelation, again, is to reveal the nature of God and to lead our hearts to worship Him. The goal is to change your life, to change your heart, your mind, the way that you apply what you know into your life. It should eventually lead us to a place of worship. A place of worship. Why? Because at the end of the day, we cannot put any value into our own efforts for our salvation. 
It's because God is the one who has done the work. That before you were born, God has chosen you. That God has done the work. In his foresight, in his knowledge, in his goodwill, in his good pleasure, he has chosen you for a purpose. For a purpose. You are not a meaningless piece of clay. If you are here this morning, and you believe in Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord and Savior, you are not worthless. God has a purpose for you. First Chronicles 29, 11, 12. This should be our heart. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all, both Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. It is God's kingdom. God is God, and we are not. We are not. Our gospel must be a God-centric gospel that relies on his power for good works, not our own. By our own work, we have seen what happens with that. When we rely on ourselves, when we rely on our own strength, we have seen what happens, haven't we? How many of us have done that in our lives? We've tried to rely on our own traditions, our own strength, our own mind, and what we think is the right thing to do without considering God and his ability to guide our lives. And where has that led us? It may seem like good for a while, but then when our kingdom comes crashing down, we realize just how foolish we really were. That all God wants for us to do is to simply humble ourselves and recognize that it is by his strength alone that we are saved. And it's by his strength alone that we can do anything good at all. And until we come to that place, there's a lot of work that needs to be done within us, within our hearts and our minds. Now, while it's, imposs it's impossible today to biblically avoid Genesis chapter 25 and Romans chapter 9, um, how we're saved or soteriology is not, not the main point today I'm trying, trying to drive home. One question I wanted to leave you with is this. Do you think in Isaac and Rebecca's time when they had, had their children and they were considering the promise of God about who their children would be and who would serve the other. Do you think they had any idea about the end game for what was happening with their children? Do you think they had any idea what God was going to do throughout redemptive history using Jacob and not Esau? Do you think they had any, any idea uh, that Moses would one day try and come through the land of the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, and that they would forbid him passage? Do you, you consider that one day that king uh, named David, who was a man after God's own heart, would one day destroy the Edomites, and that they would reign over the Edomites? Do you think they even considered that as a possibility? In their foresight, in their forethought, were they even thinking about that? Did they think that then there would be a revolt, and that Israel and their sin would be then uh, defeated themselves, and then back and forth they would go? They, they probably couldn't imagine that. They knew that they would be divided, but not to that extent. And to what end? To what end? That one day Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who at that time they knew that God had a promise of one who would defeat evil. That's pretty much all they knew. They didn't know exactly how he would come. That's why they were so confused when Jesus came on the scene and they said, Hey, homeboy, make us some, some bread and make us some fish. You're, you're here to serve us and then drive out the Romans from Israel. Yes, you're going to be our king, our victorious king. Yes, Lord. And then when he was dead on the cross and he was apparently seemingly defeated, like, that's not at all what I thought was going to happen. I thought he was going to reign as a king, and we were going to worship him, and he was going to give us bread all day long. That's what they thought. But the point is, in your own life, when God gives you promises, I'm telling you, what your, your forethought is, it's probably wrong. 
about how God is going to operate and how God is going to use things. Let me leave you with, with these three things. What does this mean for us, these three things? God's sovereign choices are for his glory and for our good, for our salvation. God is good, and he wants us to know that he is good. So redemptive history demonstrates his goodness. And I want you to taste and see that he is good. Test, test and taste and see the goodness of God. He is good. Trust in his promises. He will not let you down. He has not let me down ever according to his promises. Number two, God's promises and decrees are 100% guaranteed regardless of you. You cannot ruin God's plans. You can try as much as you want. You can fail all day long. You can be a crafty little guy. Uh, you can uh, swindle your brother out of his birthright. But God's calling, his choice, is still going to be true. It doesn't give you any right to purposefully do bad things. But it does mean that if God is calling you, he will not fail you. Trust in God. And finally, and this part is... Um, Focus mostly on those of you who are parents. The destiny of our children is ultimately in the hands of God. The destiny of our children is ultimately in the hands of God. That doesn't mean that we neglect our role as parents. The Bible has a very specific um, uh, guideline for how we as parents, as, as believers, are to raise up our children in the Lord. Nurture does have value. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm not saying that you as a parent uh, don't have any value. But what I'm saying is that ultimately your children, uh, how they become, uh, how they grow up, um, the providence in their life, what they're called to do, that is ultimately up to God. Um, my wife, by all accounts, should not be here. She should have thrown her life away years ago. The way that she uh, grew up in, in such a bad household, um, a very difficult situation, a neglectful situation. She was put in many dangerous situations, and uh, by all accounts, she should not be here. Why is she here following the Lord? Shouldn't she be repeating the nurture, uh, if you want to call it that, the nurture that she was raised in? Shouldn't she be repeating that? By all accounts, but here she is, I believe, because God has called you. God has called you. Or the one who is raised in a Christian household and turns and goes the other way. What do you say about that? Have you not done all the things that the Bible has told you to do as a parent? At least to the best of your ability. So that when you look back, to not get discouraged when one goes the other way. Because ultimately, you're in the hands of the Lord. You've done the best that you could. God is not going to hold you responsible for the sins of your children. Do we have any control over the way our kids are born? How much control do we really think we have and who they will become? And as long as you do the best that you can, it's good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for the fact that we stand here, we sit here, those who are saved, that you have redeemed us. It is not by our work, nothing that we have done. But God, that it was in your good pleasure to choose us. So I thank you, Lord, for this place. I thank you for these people. I do pray for the wayward sons and daughters. I pray for the, the prodigal sons and daughters who are trying to find their own way apart from you. And I pray, God, that you would make it evident to them very soon, very quickly, how it's not good to walk away from you. God, I pray that you would draw them back. You would draw them back to you. They would see your goodness. They would see the perfection in following you. And that they would just submit. They would swallow their pride. And they would follow you. Help us to trust more in you and your plan. Help us to do everything we can so long as it depends on us to do what's right. God, help us just to worship you as God and uh, to recognize that we are
not you, that we are just your creatures, whom you love for whatever reason. 